Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season, we're a little bit different. How do you, as a recruitment leader and founder, maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome back to the RAG podcast. And today is the final episode of 2021. I can't believe I can't believe I'm saying that. I can't believe 2021 is over. It's just another year, another blink of an eye. And uh, you know, it's we are just checking my watch to confirm the 15th of December, um, Wednesday the 15th of December, 12 o'clock. I am sat here wearing a Christmas jumper, which I'll explain why in a moment. Um, feeling on one hand festive because of, you know, we're at that time of year. On the other hand, I'm feeling a little bit like, oh, are we even allowed to be festive with what's going on in the world? And we're going to talk about that. Um, on today's episode, I'm joined by Adrian Kinnersley. Adrian is a UK, a UK um, individual who's moved out to the US, lives in Texas now. I'm sick of hearing about how warm the weather is anyway. We'll get into that. Um, but Adrian is the founder and CEO of a company called 20 Group. Um, with recruiters in the UK and the US. Um, they're doing some really, really cool stuff at the moment around AI and technology I want to get into. So let's get into today's episode with Adrian. Adrian, welcome to the RAG podcast. Hello. Good morning. It is, it is 6 a.m. Texas. It, is. Time, I believe. <laughs> it so, is, yeah, you got me out of bed for this. <laughs> out of bed. I feel so privileged. Have you have you got a coffee or have you had a coffee yet? I got uh, a cup of tea on the go. I'm still... Uh, Still wedded to uh, Yorkshire tea, even though I'm in Texas. <laughs> so, hang on a minute. Just show me that. Did you have twin and then tea at the end? Uh, yeah, this is a bit of genius. Uh... It around the, oh, there you go. Twin tea. I love that. Love that. <laughs> really this, I'd not, not all my uh, marketing ideas are brilliant. This is <laughs> one that stayed just with me, I'm afraid. You love, you love that one. You love that one. <laughs> well, look, Adrian, I gave you a really, really like, high level overview there, mate. Um, give, us a, give us a better introduction to who you are and what you do. All right, so um, I, uh, obviously, you know my name already, Adrian Kinnersley. I started in recruitment in uh, 99. Yeah. Uh, like like the vast majority of people in the UK, I started in an S3 business at, at Progressive. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, burned through there pretty quick. <laughs> I was yeah. out within a year. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a very different business back in the 90s. And uh I just don't think I was a, a fit for the world of progressive, um, but I but I had got a taste for and a, a, a real had a real excitement for the recruitment industry. Mm. Um, I moved uh, to become a, a, a banking uh, technology focused recruiter with um, a business then called Apex, which got acquired by TMP and became Hudson. Right. Um, and uh, through that acquisition process, I got a little bit frustrated with being part of a really big global business um and i decided then that i i wanted to go on a journey to set up my own company at some point so um went to find a smaller business that i could get a better understanding of you know how the whole mechanics of the business work versus being a big cog and a, a small cog and a big wheel rather um bumped into a guy called paul marsden at a, a client briefing and uh, he owned a business at the time called asprey marsden yeah um and uh i ended up grabbing a coffee with him after the briefing, which he, he basically just crushed the briefing. We were, we were one of these um, where you, there was like 10 recruiters all at the client. And I put my pen down halfway through going, well, I've got no chance against this guy because he's <laughs> he's clearly way better than I am. So uh, 
I uh, grabbed coffee with him, ended up working with him. I was uh, employee number 13, uh, which is unlucky for some, but uh, it turned out okay for me. Oh, that's um, nice. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I think I think actually they'd gone up a bit before that and then come back a bit. Um, and but on my pay slips, it was always employee thirteen. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was there for seven years and went from joining as a recruiter all the way up to uh, you know partner and um, shareholder and what have you. And um, uh, went through. I was running about half the business at that point uh, in the UK, and also we had an Asia business which I was looking after. Right. And we went through an MBO. Um, uh, I was uh, kind of on, on the team that acquired the, the business, and then uh, after the MBO, I sold my shares back to them and, and, and departed. And mainly that was because I, you know, I joined with the intention of getting the experience to run my own business, and then you know I'd found myself on a on a team that was a part owner of someone else's business, and it it it, it didn't really it just it just wasn't my journey. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so I, I, I uh, left there um, just before the financial crisis kicked off um, and then had my gardening leave while, every, while the world was falling apart. And wow. then uh, uh, it's decided at that point, like, you know, to set up, I was going to, I was already on the journey to set up uh, 20, you know, with no name or anything at that point. And uh, given what was going on in the world, I thought well, we could probably do with a bit of uh, financial assistance with setting up this business. And uh, I went and got Paul out of retirement and said, "Like, come on, let's uh, let's do it all again." And um, he uh, joined me in setting up Twenty. We we got going in January two thousand and nine, uh, wow. which is a pretty pretty interesting time to <laughs> start <laughs> recruitment. How long were you the garden leave in two thousand and eight. Uh, say again, sorry. How long were you on the garden leave in 2008? Um, uh, about five months. So it was, it was literally, you know, kind of. I uh, stopped working as uh, Credit Crunch was kicking off, and then it it got into like you know Lehman Brothers going bust and all that sort of stuff. While I was sound gardening leave going, oh crap! <laughs> this is uh, this is not quite what I planned. How um, did you feel at that point? That must have been bloody scary. Like. To think you've quit your job and then the world's crashing around you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a little bit unnerving. <laughs> One of the strange things was, that, you know, I, I, I was going to get a share payout from selling my shares back to the to the management team and the private equity company that acquired Asprey Marsden. But I, I wasn't going to get it until the end of the gardening leave. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was being paid a salary on the gardening leave. I literally couldn't do anything, you know, I couldn't set up a business or speak i could set it up but i couldn't speak to any clients candidates or anything like that. so it's kind of uh the nervous thing was like if this all goes west then do i do i get that payment or have i just kind of sat out the market for six months for nothing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh but you know they they, they uh you know honored the payment and on the the last day of my gardening leave that hit my bank account and then i basically just transferred it from my bank account into a company bank account <laughs> it's like just you know, took it took a, a small slither out to have a you know a little bit of fun, and then started uh, on twenty. So it was. Uh, what was your life like then? It's probably very different now. Can you remember what was your life as a as a human being like? What was your situation at the time? Uh, well, also uh, I just bought a house and I just got married. Um, mm. So uh, you had a lot of responsibilities then, even at that. Yeah, point. yeah so no income. Uh, married and bought a house. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, again a little bit stressful. Um, I remember there was one point I went to. Uh, I, I, I couldn't. I had this real problem with my jaw. I could barely open my jaw, and I, I, I um, I'd gone to the dentist, and uh, they, they said, "Well, technically, there's nothing wrong with you. So this is probably stress related. Have you, have you done anything stressful?" <laughs> so well, I've, yeah. I've uh, started a business, bought a house, and got married in the last three months. So they're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. "Oh yeah, you need to, uh, you need to chill out a little bit." And I'm like, well. No, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, that's not, mate. Sorry, mate. That's not uh, so, yeah. So, but weirdly, though, as soon as as soon as they told me that it was stress related, it kind of went away overnight. So, I guess I was kind of like holding the stress in my in clenched jaw somehow, and it just really? it just went away. So, um, you, what was it really like starting a business then in January two thousand nine? Well, paint the picture for us. Uh, I think you know one of the one of the things that became an advantage is that you, you know. If you got if you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. 
So, you know, kind of, you, you, you're kind of like boxed in a corner and you just, you, you either die or come out fighting. So, um, it, it was it was weird because uh, also I had restrictions from um, you know, getting the shares from the paid out from the last company, so I couldn't I couldn't really tap into any old markets or clients or candidates, and you know they they called me up and uh, they, they weren't we weren't hiring anyone anyway because it was, <laughs> I was previously pretty much geared around banking, and you know they were all calling me up saying can you get me a job outside of banking. Oh, I couldn't get a job anywhere because I didn't have any clients. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, so you know, it was, it was a, a a bit of a weird experience because it was totally totally cold. Um, but uh, you know, an advantage in a way because it forced you to look at you know where where is busy, what's going on in the world, and um, you know, I can I can uh, as soon as I get a, a you know any jobs or opportunities on, I can really commit to it because I got I got nothing else. Um, yeah. And that actually became part of the part of the sell for people, which is you know if you if you really want a good job doing on something and you really want to you know kind of make sure if you are hiring you've you've uh, covered all your bases then i've literally got nothing else to do so <laughs> you know I, i'm your guy you think um, we'll respond well to that at the time uh well yeah i mean i didn't quite package it like that but uh <laughs> it was a paraphrased version of that um but yeah no it kind of it kind of really worked and we uh, we hired a, a couple of people as well who had um we, we actually started off focused on insolvency and corporate recovery because I figured that, you know, businesses are going bust, so that must be busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and also then stumbled into uh, commodities because, um, uh, you know, going back to that point that, that, that you know, the oil price was pretty high and um, uh, commodities companies were booming. And, and as part of the regulatory changes, a lot of the banks were um, having to either sell or divest or, or wind down their commodities businesses so a lot of the people from the banks were going into work for energy companies who were setting up trading arms um and so I, you know i knew loads of people that were were kind of on that journey so we, we right. ended up focused around a similar kind of markets technology and finance but um within the within the energy uh, trading companies versus the banks um, so i kind of found a, a couple of little niches by look, just looking at well i can't i can't speak to financial companies and they're all no one's hiring anyway so where where are the where are the flows that, that are still busy in the world and how do i quickly learn how to be an expert in those things um, right so. what what where did the word 20 come from or the name 20 come from uh well uh it's it's, a, it's not that exciting a story but uh, so we couldn't use uh paul's paul's name because of the uh, asprey marsden sale yeah. you know they own the name um Kinnersley is not really a name you uh, put on a business. It's, it's bad enough. I have to spell it a million times a day. So, um, you know, we, we, we set about trying to find uh, a, a brand name that we could use, that we could, um, it, it could embody the values that we decided on in the business hadn't been used in another recruitment company. And importantly, we wanted it to be able to be easy to pronounce, spell and, and uh, use all over the world. Um, one of the things I learned from running an Asia business at Asprey Marsden is that you don't want a word that people can't really pronounce in the locations that you're in. So most of the time, people in Asia thought I was calling from Aston Martin because I couldn't really pronounce Asprey Marsden. And my name doesn't really work very well either. So, no, no. Uh, so anyway, Paul and I basically you know, we had, a, had a short list of names and we were going to meet up to um, uh, go through all of the names. Uh, and they're all pretty terrible. And um, we, we ended up having... 10 uh, 20 names on the, on the list because he had bought some and I bought some we we're trying to whittle it down um and we, we over and over again we kept saying that we can't we can't end the day with 20 names we've got to get down from 20 like let's do you know and and then the word 20 kept coming up through the conversation and then after about three hours of arguing which I should we just call it 20 <laughs> that's how we ended up with that name uh we were under a bit of time pressure because we'd, we'd accidentally kind of before we'd even set up the business sold um ages a little bit but we'd sold a uh, an advertising campaign in the sunday times for a for a client that was looking for a, a non-executive director to add to their board and it was for a, a, Ch a chinese uh, business that was related to, to um, uh, activities in china uh, that were the companies in china that were floating on the london stock exchange and the olympics was coming up at the time um so we wanted to get the the and it was in china so we wanted to get the advert in the paper at the same time as the the with china was in the in the news for the for the olympics so we we basically had a day to come up with a name um and we, we also wanted it to stretch across levels and we thought well if we run it on a 
uh, advertising campaign for a board level and um, it, it works for that, then, you know, it could, it could work for pretty much everything else. Yeah. And it was an interesting experience because, you know, all these kind of really senior board members of companies and non-executive directors and so on, they were, they were responding to the advert and, and, you know, ringing me up saying, I'm pretty sure we dealt with you guys before. The name's very familiar. And at that point, basically the entire business was me and a laptop and a yeah, Blackberry, yeah. Blackberry, Blackberry and a spreadsheet with their names on it. And I was like, you know what? I think we had that with Hoxton. <laughs> people just associate with Hoxton and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hoxton, Hoxton, yeah, yeah. You guys, have been like, no, we've we've not been around. Like, we started last month. Yeah, <laughs> and it was quite a similar story in terms of you know a word that was easy to pronounce. It was not used before. Made up word. I like made up words. That yeah. was that. that that's quite hard to try and be clever enough to make a word up. It took us like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, 20 is cool. I mean, you're going to get recruitment companies popping up now, like 19 and 21, and 28. Well, so, at that time when we did it, you know, pretty much everyone was called, you know, uh, they were like what I call, yeah, like solicitor, like legal yeah. firm names, like first name, you know, t- yeah. t- and, and the trend was you, you know, a lot, a lot of those companies don't have any correlation with anyone at all. They just pick no. two kind of yeah, posh yeah, yeah, yeah. or cool sounding names. And so we wanted to try and, you know, run in the opposite direction. And, and really we came up with the values first of what we wanted the business to be like, um, which is largely a reaction to things that I disliked about businesses. And, uh, what would you, how would you describe that then? What were the values you set out at the beginning? Uh, so there's still the same values today, which is uh, your life short, be eclectic and crystal clear. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the rationale behind that was that, you know, the life short was like, we, you know, we just, we just want to, we're uh, you know ambitious we want to achieve and we, we want to be somewhere where uh you know th- there's there's less messing around and we're, we're just getting on and um you know, trying to trying to do well on behalf of our clients and candidates um mm-hmm. and be eclectic was uh, you know it was, it was kind of pre the diversity being a you know kind of a real driver for everyone and i just got you know fed up in my former career of being in businesses where you know everyone was a 22 year old guy wearing a shiny suit and pointy shoes and gelled hair and you know kind of selling oh, their grandma yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> i found that quite boring and uh was was more interested in trying to find people that uh w- w- were you know actually more diverse but we you know we, we used the word eclectic at the time because we were you know just more interested in having a mix of people and and, and uh you know kind of reflecting more of the environment around us than you know hiring all the same types of people yeah um, like a little micro economy that that we've created in this industry yeah, yeah it's i think it's very different these days to be fair but back it then is. it was, it, totally. it was still, uh, i like to think we were part of the part of the change there well, um i'll give you credit for that one and then what was the third one it was uh, to be crystal clear um and again that was a pushback on um the environments that i've worked in before where you, you weren't necessarily encouraged to be crystal clear with your uh, clients or candidates. And also, you know, internally, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, sort of fabrication around the truth for the, for the workforce. Yeah. And, I, you know, I just, I just can't be bothered with that. So I, I figured if we make it part of our values that we can be completely honest about what's going on, whether it's good or bad, then, you know, we don't have to create any stories all the time. And I've been sat in businesses before around a board table and they were going, well, ha- yeah, we've made this decision. How, how do we spin it to people that it's a good decision? And I've been sat there going, like, you know, if you can't just tell them, then it's not a good decision. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do we? Why don't we go back and change the decision so we can just explain to people honestly what we're doing, yeah. rather than, you know, trying to create this, you know, sort of web of uh, uh, lies or, or um, you know, confusion so people don't notice what's really going on. Which I, I just, you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to run a business like that. Um, no. Makes sense. And there's still, there's still, if you look at where we are today, and you know, when we come onto the tech that we've been building, it's, it, you know, it's largely been born out of following those, those values, um, and uh, you know, trying, trying to live by those initial decisions that we made. I just want to have a quick word from our sponsors, Vincere, as um, an, an amazing sponsor throughout the whole of 2021 to the podcast. You may, I want, I want to just show you this, this jumper. Look, they've, they've made me this, this Christmas jumper with my face on it. And, you know, if anyone knows me, they know I probably like stuff with my face on it. It says uh, on the back there, Vinny loves the rag. Um, they've made, they made me this box that had like, you know, I've got baubles, I've got Christmas hats, I've got all sorts in there. Um, and it was just such a classy touch the way they did that. 
Um, and when I spoke to Eloise and the team and, and I said, like, well, what's this about? And they were like, well, our, our main word this year and next year is, is all about community. They're trying to build a real, in, you know, inclusive community in the recruitment world. And, and touches like this just show you the brand that they are and the way they treat their customers and their suppliers. So the recruitment operating system, I don't even need to go into it more than that. They've, they've had an amazing year. If you're interested in working with Vincere, I know so many rag listeners, every time I speak to someone on the phone about the po about the podcast or our services, they always mention that they're, you know, they're in talks with Vincere. So I hope you work with these guys. Um, if you do want to get some deals out of them, mention that you're a rag listener and you will get discounts. How has the business grown then? So at the beginning, it was just you with with Paul, was Paul involved, like hands on, picking up the phone and things like that, or was he? Uh, not so much. We, you know, occasionally we'd wheel him out for uh, you know ceremonial visits to you know clients and stuff like that. But he was, uh, you know, kind of more uh, financial and and advice. So yeah. you know, the I, I wanted a, a touch point that you know as we were as we were going through. Uh, you know the normal sort of uh, experience of growing a business. If you know, if you had a, a fork in a road decision where you say we can go this way or this way, I, you know, I wanted someone who'd been there and done it before that I could uh, say like, which way do we go? <laughs> Just you know, kind of have a, a perspective on it. So you know, he's he's been uh, constant you know, guidance you, throughout the business. Go back to the beginning then, or early days, as the business grew. What can you can you pinpoint some of those forks that were that stand out? Um. Yeah, it's interesting, really. I mean, we, we, we uh, I mean, there's a couple of things that I think we were making mistakes on that we shifted, um, and there's there's some others that um, we uh, decided to double down on. Um, and, and in hindsight, I'm not too sure which ones are right or not. But you know, the, the we we were a little bit slow into getting into contract, um, and you know, he was a uh, uh, you know significant uh, contributor to saying you got to you got to shift this business and 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 uh start a you know growing a contract business uh when we started out we were hiring mainly experienced hires from competitors um and trying to gear the business around being attractive to, to moving people from uh, one competitor company to to us and um one of the one of the shifts as well was was uh organic growth and um hiring juniors and training them up um and then we had a you know internationalization which i was dead keen on um and uh you know we we well uh, the pro and the con of it is we've ended up in a real good spot but it, i think we did that a bit too early um and uh stretched the business a bit thin uh, it certainly was challenging to uh was that when with the with the us move yeah 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 so we set up in the when did that in, start and what, what what was the reason you decided on that uh it was it was we we uh started it in 2011 and opened on the ground in 2012 uh which was again a little bit ahead of you know it's pretty common these days for uk recruitment businesses to to, to come out to the us but it wasn't so common back then um and you know i, I as i mentioned before i'd, I'd run an, an asia business at, at asprey marsden and um did you live in asia no, no, I ran it remotely from the UK. Wow. So uh, I was used to early starts. So this doesn't bother yeah. me that much because I was <laughs> getting up at four in the morning to be on the phone. Wow. Uh, uh, and um, it, it, when we came to do 20, it didn't, it, it just didn't really appeal to me to do, to do Asia again. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think I'd, I'd scratched that itch and I'd learned the challenges there. And, and um, the, the the scalability of the US and the, the opportunity um, was, was just more more exciting and um, at, the, at the time lots of you know the advice I was getting was you know British businesses always fail in America and it's really hard and nobody really knows how to do it and just stay in your lane um, and that's like red rag to a ball so I was like you know f you I'm <laughs> I'm gonna go do this um, and uh, I think that was kind of some youthful exuberance that probably it was the right decision but probably a bit early in the evolution of the, of the where business. was the business what did the business look like when you made that call uh we i think we had kind of 10 12 people in the uk um and yeah, it, it still sound, it sounds like you're in your infancy doesn't it and then you're already thinking about the next market which is it's rare at that say at that scale yeah or dumb depending on your <laughs> perspective <laughs> uh, so uh, to be fair, Paul, Paul uh, again was the voice of reason saying this isn't, you know, probably something we should be doing right now. And um, 
How mature was the team in the UK? Uh, you mean an experience or mentality? <laughs> Either of those is important. Um, uh, I mean, they were a good team um, and they were doing well, but still, you know, still the early days of the business really we were only a few years old and, and, and it, it, it wasn't, I would say, a gelled culturally cohesive unit. It was yeah. kind of individuals that were doing okay in the, you know on their own markets and what have you but it it, it, it was a bit disparate and, and uh, disjointed and, and I, partially i think that was you know due to starting on markets that we weren't so familiar with and then and then sort of growing back into markets as, as our restrictions eased off and, and the world started to normalize and it had kind of become at that point kind of a little bit disjointed um probably should have focused on uh, sorting that out before i then disjointed it even more by going <laughs> so it, was you, it was you wasn't it that went to the us yourself or no i, I um hired a, a guy who i kind of uh, known for a little while and bumped into a few times and um he, he had a uh he was in the uk and had a green card and yeah. uh i was like okay well you know he, he he wanted to go back to the us and i was excited about doing it so um we we uh joined up and he he went and launched it for us uh and i was going to and from um which was uh you know kind of again where the challenge came in for me was that uh, a lot of travel at a point when i was yeah, just married and having kids and all that kind of stuff which uh uh was, was how challenging you, how often were you away uh varied really um it wasn't it wasn't like a regular sort of like this is a well-organized uh you know well-trodden path or routine it was kind of on on demand sort of travel so um sometimes uh every month and then sometimes you go a couple of months without without it uh but you know the, the to answer the question as to how it came about it was it was driven by demand from the clients at the time um and you know a lot of a lot of the financial services firms that we we used to deal with that as we were coming out of our restrictions we, we wanted to start dealing with again um you know obviously they they had had lots of people in the uk that had hung on in there and kept dealing with them through the difficult times and a lot of the uk business was going to those firms and um for us to get back into those clients you know a couple of them were saying well you know we need, we need help in new york if you could help us out there then you know we'll give you a crack and yeah. so you know, that was that was our uh, way to get back into those clients but also to you know to, to grow the business so um and you going back to previous to 20 you were a manager leader like you you'd gone through the billing into leadership and training and you yeah. know you, you had some experience of nurturing people so do you think you know how much of that working for Aspie Mars and translated into you know oh, being, huge being um uh, you know, it was a really smart decision uh, to, to, in order to learn how to run a, a business to go on, on uh, to join a smaller company first and go on yeah. a go on a growth journey with them. Um, I was late to management. I didn't I didn't didn't want to do it, so um, I was focused on billing. And you know, I was about six seven years into my recruitment career before I uh, started to to take on uh, leadership, and um, uh, that was I I think that was really. Uh, you know, kind of fortuitous journey because but by, by, by that point I really wanted to do it. So I was very invested in um, the journey of learning how to influence people, coach people and, um, you know, kind of develop them on their own journey. Uh, and uh, the the uh, advantage of, uh, I, would, I would say, sales and recruitment for me is very much a learned skill because so, I, was, I was awful at it to begin with and I had to, I had to learn it. Um, so, you know, by the time I came to uh, developing people and, and, and managing them and leading them, I, I was really interested in breaking it down for people to make it easier and taking them on that journey. So um, the, the, the point that I left Asprey Mars, I was managing, I think about 40 people. Um, so, you know, I'd gone from being a consultant in that business and, and just focusing purely on billing to building teams and taking over uh, bits of the business. And um, you know, I think that was a really important journey for, for me personally to, to go on before before starting a business um and also paul was very you know kind of generous with his time uh, in, in, in as mars and in regards to that he indulged me in learning about other areas of the business um which 
you know, if you're if you're in a massive corporate company, no, nobody sits down with you and explains like this. You know, this is how cash flow works, or yeah. you know, this yeah. is what invoice discounting is. Um, you, you know, you just like shut up and make more money. Um, whereas, uh, you know, I think uh, part part of the time I'd have a you know I had a deal with him like you know if, if I hit this target, you know, will, will you, you show me how to do this? And he'd just keep giving me ridiculous targets to make me go away that i i kept it so you had to you had to keep this end of the bargain <laughs> yeah it makes sense so you you've got that foundational layer so in 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 the time that the u.s starts so you like i'm thinking like you know were you still billing at that point were you still responsible for doing deals if you're trying to uh, not 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 really billing but um you know being involved in winning business and you know i'd kind of haven't really built very much through 20 I'd, I'd, I'd give it you know give stuff to people to to pick up yeah. so uh, you know as i as i was kind of getting involved with things and um winning business i was you know handing it off rather than uh, you know hands-on billing on it um and and again i guess, I guess that was it came from the experience of leaving asprey mars and it didn't it, it didn't really serve me to sit there and bill it was it, you know it was it was better to help feed the the, you know the the people that we were trying to hire and grow um and uh you know so it's still very busy um but not you know not uh not ringing a bell doing deals on my own right, 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 right. it's a totally <laughs> different mindset and i think look, i've said this on so many episodes i think it's where a lot of brands you know go wrong or no, don't go wrong sorry but the ones that say they want to scale in recruitment yeah typ typically the ones that stick around 10 staff they usually they they say they want to scale they want to they want it but they don't want to they don't they don't spend the time developing people they spend, yeah. their, time, spend their time being a rainmaker all day and doing deals and, and it's you kind of need to make a decision i think yeah i think that one of the bits that was you know really interesting in our evolution was the hiring um so we, we i hired a, a chap in the uk called james warren who's our uk md and um I uh, pretty much handed over the, the European business to him. Um, and at that point, we, we were kind of in the infancy of, our, of, of figuring out how we would organically grow. Um, so I, I pretty much became in-house trainer. So I, I kind of built and developed our um, uh, academy and spent most of my time on figuring out how do we get a, uh, someone with no experience into this business and then training and educate them on their, you know, on their journey. Um, so, you know, I figured that was going to be very important for our evolution. And, um, you know, I try and put, put myself on whatever task is <clears throat> most important for the next stage of evolution of the business. And, you know, it's, it's, sometimes they're not very glamorous. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, if, you, if you look at our business now globally um, and who the top billers are and where the, you know, who's in the leadership team, pretty much all of them have come through that process. So, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be performing how, how we are now, you know, had, you know, wouldn't necessarily needed to be, but somebody really needed to commit to, to learning yeah. that. And, uh, it kind of, it kind of helped to get me out of the way of him and, and, uh, enable him to make the business his own in Europe. So when um, did you make the call to go to the US yourself and why? Uh, was, I was looking at it kind of around, uh, 2016, 2017 and, uh, to kind of sped up for a couple of reasons one um you know brexit in the uk kind of made me think well we need to diversify our business further you know at that point um we were probably three quarters of the revenue in the uk uh, and G gp and profit in the uk and one quarter in the us um we had a we had already a, a, a foothold here but um it had become quite a perm orientated business and it, it you know mirrored the journey of the uk in a way and that uh, it was perm orientated and we had a handful of people that were good operators but it wasn't really a kind of functioning cohesive scalable unit um so uh then um we, you basically we had a board meeting where we'd agree that we need to focus more time on it and um we looked around the board and said well who's going to do it <laughs> and, uh, it was only it was only me that was prepared to do it so i was like all right well i'll, I'll you know i'll go home speak speak to the wife uh, and did you have kids at that point yeah yeah, yeah. Mar married with two kids and um uh we we were uh at the stage where we were we were living in central london in, in clapham and yeah. um uh kind of starting to look at you know kids were well, my oldest was just at school age and thinking like you know this isn't really 
uh, representative of the childhood that I had growing up in rural Lincolnshire and, and I'm not sure I want her kind of walking through the barbed wire school gates and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> So yeah, starting yeah. to think about you know where we where we move outside of london anyway um and then um you know kind of came home from a board meeting and pitched the idea like you know how about texas <laughs> so uh we we you know we came on a uh family vacation to texas which everyone thought was really weird uh like why the hell are you going on holiday to texas um you know checked out schools and um neighborhoods and things like that and then and then made the move in uh, 2018 um, how, would so, you describe, how would you describe both the impact on the business of you being there, but also the the, the cultural change of, of deciding to live in the US? Well, if, if you pick the business first, um, be, because of that evolution not happening of uh, becoming a scaled business and, and again, being not, not, yeah. not pushing on to contract, um, the, the guy that I mentioned earlier on that had the green card decided to, to move on. Um, and... Uh, you know, we, we'd uh, just committed to a, a, a bigger office in New York and, um, I, you know, I was committed to making it grow. Um, and that was in, uh, you know, April um, in 2018. And we, we, I wasn't due to move out with the family till August. Um, so I was then on a, uh, from like March through to August, I had a pretty brutal regime where I was setting up a business in Austin I was also managing the New York office and I was flying back to the UK occasionally to <laughs> remind my family what I look like. And I was on like a, uh, a monthly loop of a couple of weeks uh, in each location and then popping back to the UK, which is, you know, really dumb uh, from a, a personal, uh, mental and physical well-being yeah. perspective. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, the, the uh, family moved, moved out and we also hired a... Um, uh, a, a new MD for our New York office um, and uh, everything started to kind of settle down and, uh, and we were walking then, a, uh, you know, much more um, uh, aligned strategy path of how we would, uh, you know, kind of mix the uh, revenue streams for perm and contract in the U S and, and, um, and, and grow nationally um and you know when the when the my family came out in the summer um it was kind of a bit weird because i i turned out where we'd chosen we wanted to live um there wasn't very many places to rent houses so uh i, I wanted to rent first to make sure we got the yeah, neighborhood yeah. right and all that kind of stuff and um it came down to about a, a, a month before they were due out and uh you know all of our stuff was in a container ship halfway across the atlantic and i still hadn't got anywhere to live so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my uh, wife at that point was starting to get a little bit stressed and I was like you know don't worry I got this um, and then uh, like pretty much last minute this house was for sale came on the market for rent and I just said oh, I'll just you know just rang up the realtor and said I'll just take it you know she sent me a picture and I was like yeah I'll be fine I'll take it um, and then yeah I, I, it was just a like a rush decision to have somewhere for us to land and then, you know, it just turned out when I actually went to look around it, it was, a, it was just stunningly beautiful house and it was in a great neighborhood and uh, amazing schools. And, um, you know, it was a real, uh, to, you know, kind of as, as an entry point to life here, it was a, it was a, a really good decision. Um, I had, had an option of one that was a really shitty cheap house and one that was a, a, a nice, you know, over my budget house. I, I, I went for the over budget option. It was a good decision. <laughs> Why didn't you go to New York? Why did you choose Texas when you already had the business? Why don't you just go and be the MD of New York? Um, again, it's that kind of ambition, uh, sort of uh, probably ruling the decision over logic. Um, and um, I, I, I wanted to, we wanted to grow across the US. Um, and uh, I felt like, you know, looking at the businesses that were in New York, they mainly stayed in new york or, or, or the uk businesses that that, that that had done that and i thought there was a a, a bigger and more interesting opportunity because we already had a presence in new york to look at how do you how do you actually you know kind of crack america versus just you know just deal with the same um yeah. businesses in and around new york um so um we we did a bit of research on where i thought would be a, a you know hot place to to build a, a primarily tech orientated recruitment business and uh, picked Austin um, uh, and Texas 
uh, it's still on a time zone enough that I can chat with Europe yeah. and it's you know, kind of bang in the middle of, uh, of the US and uh, uh, obviously a very growing uh, tech hub. Um, and, you know, it turns out uh, as COVID happened, that was a really, uh, you know, really good decision um, because, the, you know, the, the recruitment market's changed an awful lot over here and, uh, you know, everything is national now. So being in a time zone where we can cover a, a lot more ground is... Um, what do you mean by that? Everything's national now. Uh, so, pre pretty much in, in, in tech, uh, anyway, uh, an awful lot of the roles are fully remote now. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the clients have completely decentralized. So, uh, you know, regardless of where the headquarters or, or the office hubs of the company are, that, the, you know, the staff are, are dispersed and also the hiring is as well. Um, so, you know, we've got clients in Detroit that we're placing people from Ari you know, in Arizona and Philadelphia, we're in California and, you know, it's, it's just all completely um, uh, geographically diversified. So if you're, if you're just on the East coast, it's, it's, it's just a real pain to be you know, dealing with a client on the West coast and candidates all over the mm -hmm. place. So, you know, being uh, central uh, and, you know, having a hub here as well as in uh, yeah. New York and we've also opened in Charlotte as well. Um, it, it, it just enables us to be a bit more nimble. Charlotte, is that Texas as well? No, that's in North Carolina. North Carolina. Uh, I thought, I thought, I thought I'm, I'm getting this wrong, but I'm going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> How far is that from where you are? Uh, it's kind of it's kind of in between uh, uh, Texas yeah. and New York, so a couple of hours uh, flight. Right. Um, yeah, it's a big old place here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of ground to cover. And how did you guys? How did you guys evolve when it came to COVID as a business? So you, I'm sure in London you had a pretty traditional business in the office uh yeah i mean it, you know in in uh, both the, you know in all locations really it was, it was pretty traditional recruitment culture where we were you know fully in the office you know, five days a week and uh um you know we hadn't really uh considered or looked at remote or hybrid working or and i didn't even know the word hybrid working back then no. um and um you know it was uh it was a big it was a big change um you know, fortunately, uh, we, we, were, we were in a real fortunate position because the, the data analytics platform that we had built um, uh, already with, with no intention of it being, you know, used for remote working and, and enabled us as we as we did, you know, go fully remote for the you know initial part of COVID. Um, it, it, didn't, it enabled us to run the business exactly the same way and didn't really change anything because, you know, everyone was already connected and we had full access to all the information we needed to run the business um so it's a real you know real uh advantage you know in, in making that shift because everybody just worked from home and did it yeah, in exactly the same way um so you know in, in in some respects it wasn't very difficult it wasn't difficult but then um you what know others trust, what about trust though in people do you feel like that was something that you were tested by yeah, I mean, it, you know, I think it's the same for everyone, right? And, you, you know, you have all these ingrained uh, you know, thought processes of you know, what you need to do to, to, to run a business. And then all of a sudden, they were, everything was turned on its head. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the reality for us was the same as, you know, a whole bunch of other people in that the vast majority of people in the business were, you know, amazing. Yeah. Um, and there was, you know, a very small minority that, you know, decided to try and abuse the trust <laughs> yeah. you know they didn't last very long <laughs> yeah. uh but you know it's, it, it, if anything it's galvanized our culture and, and 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 you know the 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 people that we already felt were you know committed in the future of the business have, have you know really been amazing um and uh, uh you know it's, uh, it's it's one of those uh events that i think is a complete game changer for not and not, not just our business but the industry and the people that kind of lean into it and get it right and uh, adapt the best are the ones that are going to you know do brilliantly well out of it and you know others will others will continue to struggle um, i believe i completely agree with that by the way like, i just think it's just it's changed so much and and that brings me kind of to today really with the you know we talked a bit before the show we, you know yeah. we're in the uk now we're, we're kind of it feels a little bit like groundhog day from like this time yeah. <laughs> You know, I remember in October thinking COVID was pretty much done. Like, you know, it was literally planning Christmas, planning your events, planning, yeah. thinking about flying to see clients in, in different parts of the world, thinking about meeting my team in South Africa next year. 
And now it's all Omnicon has just put everything back to yep. fear of where we are. Now you mentioned Texas is not changed much yet. You, you're quite a relaxed culture over there, and yeah. warmer. Like, tell us about what it's like for you. Uh, well, I mean, it was, it was, it was a strange um, journey to begin with because um, it, it, if you go back to when it all started, um, you, we, we had an office in Berlin at that point and an, and an office in the UK. And uh, I was on calls with those guys with them going like, you know, this thing's really serious. And we got, we, you know, we're, we're probably going to be on lockdown and we're, you know, we're probably going to be having to change everything in the business. And then, you know, I was in Texas at the time and no one had a care in, in the world. <laughs> it was a really strange. It took a little while for it to hit over here. Um, and so, you know, to get yourself in the mindset of you, you got to make some you know, life changing business decisions. Um, uh, that are, that are massively impacting you know half of your business in Europe whilst you know you're in a situation where nobody seems to even acknowledge that there's a, there's a problem it, it was quite jarring to, to do that um, and uh, you know then like a couple of weeks later it hit here and everyone's kind of queuing up for toilet roll and buying guns and things like that which is <laughs> kind of a weird a weird response but yeah. uh, uh, so that, that that was, uh, you know, kind of uh, mentally challenging from running a business perspective. And then cu culturally, as it's evolved, um, you know, pretty much each location that we're in is, is, is dealing with it in a different way. Um, you know, so New York's more similar to the UK. And, you know, I was in New York recently and, to, you know, to sit down in Starbucks, you've got to have a vaccination card and you, know, you, you just have to wear masks in you know, a lot of places and so on. And, and uh Charlotte put it, you know, kind of bounce in and out of having mask mandates and, you know, kind of it varies on a, a, a seemingly regular basis. Uh, you obviously know what the situation in the UK is. Um, yeah. And we pretty much got, you know, we, we're, we're on a hybrid model and we allow people to, you know, come, come go from the office as, you know, as they please. And we try and kind of keep a regular format on it. But most people are, are in the office most of the time again now because they, because they want to be. Um, yeah. Well, they were until recently. <laughs> uh, and in the US, there are either two or three days, um, uh, you know, but, in, you know, in Texas, it's it's, uh, it, it's a different kind of view from New York and Charlotte. And, uh, <laughs> to, to, you know, it's, it's a lot more kind of relaxed here. Um, yeah. And, uh, it's you know, it's, it's more common. You very rarely see people wearing a mask or, um, yeah. uh, you know, kind of, changing their behavior as much due to covid like you say the weather's warmer people are outside it's not as you're not all cooped up inside pubs and bars and what have you like we are and... yeah it's very much an outdoor lifestyle and uh, there's also a lot more space yeah. <laughs> so you know kind of you know even in the living situation and things like that you know you're not not really in apartments as much and you know obviously some people are but it, it, it is much more spread out um so i think the you know the the environment leads to a different approach to it um and uh you know it, weirdly i think each location is probably reacting or or acting in a way that's in the best interests of you know the culture and the environment they're in but it's just it's just a, a little bit unusual to be tr trying to navigate the challenges of a business in you know in each location and, and, the, and them all seemingly reacting very very differently to it yeah um what do you think is gonna do you, do you see any change, any big changes in the new year from what you're seeing across the client base or from the teams in each location? Um, hopefully not really in the client base because, you know, it's been a fantastic year from a, from a recruitment perspective. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I think everyone has kind of, you know, pretty much understood that you know, this is, this is life now. Yeah. And um, you, you gotta, you gotta figure out, how to operate as best you can in the in, in the situation that we're in um and you know some some businesses have done um you know some of our client base has done really well um and you know their 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 businesses similar with our technology their businesses that probably unintentionally at the time are just are gonna you know really tearing it up because of the way that the world has changed and um mm -hmm. that's you know i get i guess the 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 luck of the draw in some instances um and you know it's, it's been devastating for uh, you know a lot a lot of industries and a lot of people and then you know and and there's a, a small portion that are doing really well
Um, for sure. That's the same with like, you know, the financial crisis and everything else. There was, you know, there was, from a business perspective, there's, you know, there's winners and losers in every situation. And um, I, I, I really wish we could have got to the point where the working environment has evolved the way it has without, without the, without you know, the help. Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally agree. Our other sponsor today is Odro, the guys that, I mean, I don't even need to, again, introduce Odro, the, the number one video technology platform in the sector. Um, but I know as people are starting to wind down at, at Christmas, you might be thinking, you know, what could I do in the next week and a half between now and the end of the year to get my ducks in a row for 2022? And Odro is saying, look, we are there to talk to you. And what they're offering is an opportunity to analyze your recruitment process and give you an honest opinion on how you can implement video at the various touch points that will enhance your performance. Um, any real, any, any first time customers as well can take advantage of a new 90 day guarantee that they're giving you. So you're not tied in anymore. You can sign up with Odro and after 90 days, if you're not happy, you can walk away. So to get access to this, to, to get your ducks in a row between now and the end of the year, go to odro.co.uk forward slash demo. And, uh, I'm certain you get something from it. You'll enjoy it. That leads me on then to your recently, you know, rebranded business. Yes. Um, you know, 20 AI. And then you're, I wanted to get under the bonnet for the next few minutes around this. What is this AI focus that you talk of like? And what, what, what is, what was the need for the rebrand? Uh, well, we, we started this journey back in uh, 2013 of, of um, really being focused on uh, being a data driven business. And, and it come, comes from our value of being crystal clear. We, you know, we wanted mm. it to be open of you know with everyone you know everything that's going on in the business and started to build a, a platform that enabled that to happen um and we looked at we we had a, a third party data platform in the business for a while and and um got frustrated that we couldn't quite get it to do what we wanted it to do so we thought well, okay we'll just we'll just build our own um and you know my my view uh broadly of, of uh, the the industry that we're in and and you know being a tech recruiter you know we're placing people all, all day long in companies who are having to evolve and build their own technology in order to stay competitive in the world that we're in and you know weirdly if you look at recruitment companies they don't they don't typically do that we're you're, you know we're buyers of technology rather than builders of technology uh, on the whole and um i find that really strange because we have you know, we have databases full of thousands of people who can who can build technology, and, and you know, we don't do it; we buy it. And um, so, you know, we took a slightly different approach and said, "Well, you know, we, we, we're going to build our own uh, system that enables us to get access to exactly what we want when we want, and and uh, you know, give give the consultants in the business the tool that or the tools that we feel enable them to be more efficient and get better at their job and uh, collaborate easier and so on." And we are we are acquiring some technology as well because you know sometimes people build stuff that's you know it's a fully formed product that saves you time from from building it yourself and it does exactly what you needed to do and and so you require that but then you know a lot of times there's there's a direction of travel that we wanted to go in that we there wasn't an exact product or you're yeah. gonna have to buy like three different products and what it's type of, what, what type of outputs are you are you talking about like what type of things did you want that perhaps weren't out there right right now well um you know, so the first product that we had was wildly complex. Um, yep. So, you know, basically show everyone in the business everything you needed to know to be running the business. And that's not, it, but to get to the, uh, to what a consultant needed to see to know how, what was going on on their desk was actually too complicated. Um, so the first version we built was a, was a simplified product that we looked at what are the actual drivers that a consultant really needs to know that's happening in real time in their desk. And let's get that to them in a, in a really easily digestible format. Um, and where we've evolved to is that, you know, that's uh, typically described as descriptive analytics. So, you know, what, what most people have in the world these days is, is some sort of system that shows them what has happened in their business uh, or on their desk or, you know, whatever, whatever level they're at in, in, the, in the company, they can see what has happened in the past. Um, and where we started to evolve to is like, well, you know, now we know exactly what's happened in the past. And, and a, a, a lot of businesses don't get past that because they don't shift their culture. And, and, you know, this comes back to the point where we started to hire people organically. We, we, we really focused on 
uh, data integrity and, and how we incentivize people to record accurately what they're doing, because if you don't put good data in, yeah. you can't get good, good information out. Yeah. Um, and then it evolved to, uh, you know, the, the, the journey you then go on is you really start to look at predictive analytics. So if you, if, you know, if you know what's happened, you can start to look at, well, what, what's going to happen if we keep walking on this path. And uh, where we're getting to now is um, it's called prescriptive, where y you can also then get from the data the advice of what your next best action should be. Um, and that's, you know, the 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 the. the journey that we're on is that you know we we want to be able to uh have the system uh kind of like a uh a manager all the time for uh recruiters uh, particularly when they're remote you know if, instead of asking like oh, what should i do now they, they should never need to ask that question because the, the the next task that takes them closer to getting a placement or you know kind of what, how they should prioritize their time is is helped but with the system for them. um so it's a it's a slightly different way of looking at running a recruitment business and, and operating within it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you take the culture of when I started, your mercurial salespeople were like, don't, don't stifle me with KPIs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now when we're hiring uh, people, it's a you know, generational thing as well. Like people that we hire now are completely engaged with, you know, they understand the value of what data can provide to them because they've, they've grown up with, you know, social media yeah. and all that kind of stuff and um, fully embrace um in fact this you know this picture behind me this is our uh this is our uh icon for uh this is who gives you advice in our business <laughs> it's really? cool. uh, yeah so the system when you know when you when you when you're getting um help and advice from the system it's from this little guy um wow. so what type of give me give me a request that a recruiter might ask the system for well it's more it's more the system will prompt you so you know there's there's uh elements of automation which uh, you know again a lot of, a lot of other companies are doing but it's the augmentation which we're working on which is slightly different whereby you know if you if if you're looking at prioritizing your jobs for instance like you, you know that's a common problem at the minute that people get lots of jobs um we're looking at figuring out and enabling a recruiter to see what's the what's the most likely to convert to a placement and uh you know prioritizing their jobs in the order of the historical analysis of their conversion ratios and our company conversion ratios with the client. So if, if someone's got a, job, a desk of like 10 roles and I don't know where to start, the system will just prioritize them for you and say, okay, this is the one that's most likely to convert to a placement. And, uh, you know, if you sent two CVs to that, you, you need to send two more and you'll get a deal. Whereas if you send two more to any one other client, you're not, you, you know, you're less likely to make a placement. Wow. Um, I like so it. It's, it's a, and then as a as an aside to that, we're also now selling um, to the client base uh, technology driven solutions. So um, we, we've got a, a big project we're about to launch in in January with a a, a cloud ERP solutions provider, which um, enables their 300 implementation partners to do their recruitment all through one channel with us. And it's a talent ecosystem that we've built. Um, which uh, has elements of automated uh, matching. So, you know, if one client puts a job on and we're, we're, we're populating the candidates to that client uh, and a, a, another client puts a job on and some of the candidates would match it, you know, automatically shortlist the candidates for that client. Um, so the, the 300 companies that all implement this uh, uh, software can, can use our talent ecosystem to uh, more quickly and automatically self-serve themselves and, and, you know, and finding talent that, that could uh, solve their problems. Uh, wow. So what links the 300? Are they part of like a community already or? Yeah, so they are all uh, implementation partners of the software company. So they right. implement that software into the end clients. Right. Um, right. So they're all looking for the same kind of talent set, um, but it's very hard to find it. So, you know, by, by centralizing it into one ecosystem, it's easier for the talent to find the opportunities and it's easier for the clients to find the talent. Uh, and it also automates things like contractors can uh, add their availability in it. So um, when the, the, the clients can see what contractors are coming available and they can favorite their contractors. And as soon as they need another one, they just press, you know, kind of accept or whatever. And it, it automatically lines that, them up for the next job. So that, that doesn't involve your recruiters at all then? In terms of it does because we're administering the system and adding the talent to the system and helping, the, you know, manage the client relationships and so on. But um as when 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 a job goes on uh the system if there's any uh 
talent that's left over from any previous searches or any candidates in there, it'll automatically match them. Um, and then, you know, the, the partner can have a, a conversation either direct with them or liaise with one of our consultants. So, look, you know, can you tell me more about this person? Yeah. Um, wow. I like it. So what's the what's the future vision for your business? How would you describe what you see? Yeah, global that? domination. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, no, I think, you know, we, we, that's shifted focus a little bit now and that we, we, we're, you know, again, in the world that we're in, we're, we're really trying to look after the people that we've got that are performing well. Um, and giving them, you know, career options, and and again building the systems that help them to be more successful. Um, and you know, obviously we're growing to to meet client demand, but the 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 drive is more around ensuring what we get. You know, we've got high GP per head, and and people are succeeding, and our clients and candidates are taken yeah. care of. Than than how many bums can we put on seats in in the shortest period of time? Um, and you know, I think. Again, that's a, you know, that's kind of an impact of COVID. It's it's it is more, you know, the people that you have that are key to your company are very precious. So you, you know, look after them and and uh, build more into the culture that feel the same way. And 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 uh, uh, that's more important than um, can you can you have a, a you know kind of a, a busload of people show up at the front door and yeah. and churn through as many of them as possible. <laughs> so in terms of your life now, then you've you know, you've built this business, you've got, you're, inv you're innovating technology, both internally and externally. You've, you've moved your life across the pond to, you know, a completely different environment. Like, how are you, um, and now, and you know, everything's remote. How do you keep yourself sane? How do you keep yourself on form? What's your, that's like my last question. Like, what's your, <laughs> you know, you sound like a guy who's just thrown everything at the business, really like over the period of time, like you've not, you've not left anything undone. Like you've gone for it full pelt. So is there a way in which you keep yourself sane in place in check without going, going too far? Uh, I mean, I have a, 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 I'm very lucky that my family is amazing. And uh, my wife is uh, absolutely incredible and, and tremendously supportive. Um, and I think that's the main uh, focal point for, for, for me outside of work is that, you know, kind of, there's, there's got to be a point to it, right? And, you know, the, the, the point for me has always been to try and enable them to have a, a life that, that uh, you know, is better than uh, it otherwise would have been. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, to provide opportunities for them. And part, part of the, you know, family-related reason for moving here was, you know, an amazing opportunity and experience for them, um, which tied up with tied up with the business one. And I think that's the, you know, for, for me, that's the 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 lucky situation I find myself in is that I have a, you know, a, a partner that is amazing and, and tremendously supportive and a, a, you know, a, a family that makes it worthwhile. Um, mm. So, so you, you, you know, get, get, getting time to spend with them is, is crucial, which I, I is still a, a challenge uh, balancing act that I have to work on um, because that's what it's, you know, ultimately all about. Um, there's no point, you know, succeeding and in, uh, in business no. and then, uh, you know, kind no. of messing that up. No, there's no point. And and I mean, I've asked this question a lot of time. Like, where does it end? Like, what? When's enough? When is enough enough? Like, because you you know, is there going to be a point where you'll be like, I've done it. You know, I've made enough money. I've I've, I've secured our future. I've I've ticked, and I just want to spend time with them. Or do you think are you that person? You'll always be driving. Uh, I think um, you know, it'd be difficult for me to envisage a scenario where I was you know kind of fishing every day or something like that you know i can't, I can't really see that um, uh but you know i kind of it would be nice to sort of a kind of de-risk my life a little bit and and be you know work uh, a little uh, you know a little more um casually or um on things that i wanted to rather than things that i had to um and you know I, i'm i'm hoping to achieve that in the next few years <laughs> um, like like but i don't i don't um i'm not you know i don't envisage in, in you know kind of a, a walk away from the business scenario in in um any time in the near future it, you know if, if if anything happens down the line it would be um to enable other people to step into the gap for me to step back a little bit but yeah. um you know, one thing I don't want to do from having the experience of starting it is start again. Um, 
it was yeah. you know i'm glad i did it but it was really really hard <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I had the uh, you know I had the age and energy to do it then, and I, I certainly don't want to uh, you know kind of go sit on a sofa with a laptop and a, a phone again and, and do it again. So I, I, you know I'd like to continue the journey on with with this business and see where we can take it. Um, but but also you know at, at some point uh, m maybe not doing calls at five a.m. would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would definitely can empathize with that. <laughs> well, look, we'll get you. Um, it's what just after seven a.m. So I'm going to let you yeah. go. Let you go back to your breakfast or whatever needs to be done. Um, well, I hope you got from it what you wanted. <laughs> of course, I'm sure. Look, you, there's no doubt, Adrian. You know, you've built a great business. You've got an, you've got a credible story. There's lots of people out there that will benefit from hearing the way that you approach things. I think, I think your your values for me stand out. You know, the, the way you want to build a business. And there's a lot of agencies out there that. Do want to go against the grain and, don't, and want to make things really clear for their people and you know they, they're not they, they, they're not interested in the, the way that they work for other people you know that that classic recruitment story is not what they want to do not what yep. they want to build so, um i think there'll be a lot of people that can empathize with this if anyone does want to reach out and just wants to pick your brains is linkedin the best place to drop you a note yeah you can get me there um uh you know i'm like most recruiters plugged into that most days yeah. <laughs> and i you know i'm i'd be happy to uh uh you know time uh time dependent uh you know kind of uh help anyone out i can and you know do yeah. that as much as possible anyway a lot of people hit me up around like how do you do the us uh, and, uh you know I'm, I'm happy to help wherever I am. it's a big place so there's there's uh opportunity for more competition <laughs> That's it. well look if anyone reaches out I'll, I'll, you'll be tagged in everything but thank you mate have a wonderful uh christmas and new year Likewise. and we will definitely get you on in the future and see how things are planning out for you over there um guys listening up um i want to say thank you this is the final episode of the year um another action-packed 2021 um for the rag podcast we have we've had a we had a break well you know if you think back to the start of the year we did um we, we raised forty thousand pounds for laptops in schools in the uk in partnership with simply commerce and red Hole, two of our customers um we then took the podcast back to the roots of focusing on you know the industry we, we had a small break in the summer. I think we've, we've definitely interviewed at least 40, uh, 40 leaders this year again. So I think we're, we're just over 200 episodes, 230 episodes, something like that. Um, we're back next year. We're not going anywhere. This is the middle of the season. I am going to be taking a bit of a break. So we're looking at about four weeks till mid-September, uh, mid mid-January, um, when I'll be back with, with new guests and new stories. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful Christmas and New Year to everyone that's listening. And uh, I will I will catch you all again very, very soon. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media, and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2,000 recruiters right now, both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week. That's live on LinkedIn at 12 p.m. on Thursday, or you can catch the show on the following Monday from 6 a.m. on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'll see you soon.